Hello and welcome to week five in cultural anthropology and keep going folks. I'm having a really good time watching you grapple with some of these issues and how many real world examples people are bringing to the discussions and just a really, really higher order learning going on. And you're all teachers. Remember that, I said that right at the beginning, you're all teachers, so we're all learning in this process, and I really appreciate the dynamic quality of the discussions. Now, we're going to go into another week of having two chapters to cover. We're gonna be covering chapters eight and nine. The first, chapter eight, is marriage and family. And the next one, big one, is race and ethnicity. And uh, marriage and family is big too. I'm just, you, we hear a lot about race and, and, you know, and I thought these would actually kind of go together, put them together, you know, in terms of ways in which we, as I'm a psychologist coming at this, so ways in which we clearly identify ourselves. You know, and we use family, social interactions, race and ethnicity as some of the major aspects in the way that we see ourselves and define ourselves in our social world. So as you do the reading for marriage and family, we're gonna look at marriage patterns and you can consider all of the different marriage patterns that we have here in the US, but also abroad, and that those patterns are the result of rational decision-making. So I'm asking you to have a discussion about that rational decision-making as a function of marriage within a particular culture that we're looking at, getting your head wrapped around that, and then the quiz has you look at kind of a sociological topic that I talk about quite a bit. If, you, if you've taken sociology with me or taken sociology here, you'll see status and roles coming up. It's one of those basic social structure things that we look at. Status being a job title, role being the job description. And those are uh, analogous to that at least. So. Uh, I'm a teacher, that's my job title, and then there's a job description that goes along that, you know, what does a teacher do and what are the expectations? And that social structure defines that particular status for me and the things that I need to do to fulfill my status. Now, within the family, there are different statuses. There might be, you know, the parents, father, mother, grandparents, sister, brother, cousin, half-brother, stepmother, you know, all those, all those other so titles, and what are the job descriptions? I just, I just threw out stepmother, stepfather, you know, kind of those things. I've been in a stepfather position, my wife is in a stepmother position, and it's not the same as being the person's parent, obviously. But we can look at those statuses and roles within the family can also look at things like other ones, like not just the individuals, but you have breadwinner, or homemaker, or childcare provider, or cook, or any one of those things, those are also statuses and roles that we might see within family. And so, we'll have a nice discussion, we'll have a night, well not a discussion, it's a quiz about that. We then move into the next chapter, chapter nine, race and ethnicity, we have two discussions the first one, probably critical, not only in this class, but also in my sociology class, that race is not genetic. Ooh, now there's genetic components that deliver to us the things that we call race. Hair color, hair texture, skin color, eye shape, all of those things that we used to visually identify different races is actually very, very small part of the thing that we refer to as race. So sociologists and anthropologists take the viewpoint that race is a construct. We build an internal representation of race based on our social interactions and what we're taught through the process of socialization. Those facts, that information that we've been taught gets associated and generalized to the physical characteristics that we might call race, but it's much more important for us to have a handle on those things that we put together, those social facts or social information. I, I, I hate to use the word facts because although within the context of our own social upbringing, 
we refer to them as the facts that we know, they're often misleading. And we often overgeneralize what we've learned about particular races when we see an individual who looks the part for that particular race. So we're going to be getting into a discussion. I'm pretty sure that one's going to blow up into some really good, that's a good thing, not blow up like in a bad, but they, I'm sure there's going to be some rich discussion. Um, and then a second one, another good one, and that is uh, immigration, looking at the history of the United States, the history of immigration. The United States is built on immigration. We go through periods of time where immigration is a good thing, immigration is a bad thing, immigrants are targeted, immigrants are the best thing since sliced bread. Let's have a discussion about that and maybe go back, maybe do some uh, individual. I know some of you might go back. Some of you are history buffs and you might go back and you will find that the United States has a long but convoluted history with immigration and certainly going on today too. And then a quiz talking about the concept of reification. This is a new term. Now reification the process by which a culture takes, socially constructs that idea of a racial, I don't know, a racial description, and then repeats it within books, media, and whatnot, and that very narrow scope of racial identity becomes the one that we think about. And probably, and I'm going to be shaming myself here for a little bit, probably the one I was most closely associated with in my own Brooking, my own upbringing was Native American. And we think about Native Americans and almost all of us, almost all, I, 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 I won't assume anybody else. I've had so little contact with individuals that I, that I would have known to be Native American that I still have those old images of leather with feathers and riding horseback and all of those sort of images which don't represent even a little bit of the modern Native American. And it's part of their culture, it's part of their history, and it remains celebrated as such. And certainly you will find individuals uh, dressing like that and up on horseback, just like anybody else. But that vision of that being what Native American is, is very prejudiced and very off kilter. And it really sets me up to have the wrong sort of Enter, uh, wrong sort of uh, expectations heading into uh, an interaction with somebody. Um, so being aware of that is one thing. Understanding where that came from, you know, in my upbringing, I can't remember, I can't remember a book that featured Native Americans that did not feature them in that particular image. And that's what we call reification. And it limits a minority. It limits our vision to see the complexity and diversity and wonderfulness of other groups because it draws them such a narrow picture. And I think this is a very, very important understanding for us to have, uh, particularly in our world today, as we are making our best effort to all live together and understand and actually enjoy. I mean, that's really the thing for me to enjoy the diversity rather than looking at, you know, trying to say we're all the same, we're not. We're wonderfully, wonderfully different. And to be able, and when we have these narrow sort of, and it can be any, it can be, if you might have, we might have, some of you might have, I might have, narrow descriptions of other people, Russians, or people from Canada, or Republicans, or dishwashers, or what drug addicts, we might have these very narrow pictures of individuals based on our experience or whatever, but that's a process of reification and it erases so much diversity, so much wonderful diversity. I think one of the things that I like about the Olympics actually, uh, which is going on as I, as I say this and, I, and I'm an avid watcher, but I don't care what 
even sport it is. It's just neat to see the uh, people from a different country and they're modern people. And it just reminds me of how silly my own internal representations are. I'm going to just put it out there. And, and just watch the... Uh, a uh, showdown in the um, in the the co-ed snowboarding snowcross, and I was touched to to to, to eyes watering when the competitors were cheering on the winner. They knew they weren't going to win, but they knew the the U.S. won. It's two of the oldest competitors. They haven't had you know and stuff like this, and they were behind them and like you're going to do this, you know. The, and then they all hugged together, and it was like, there you go, there you go. Despite all the craziness in the world, you got these people who are trained all their lives to compete for this moment, and they can show that kind of affection and caring about each other. It really down to the human level looking you know looking beyond all of the other stuff associated with the with the uh, olympics it's an amazing and to see that to see that camaraderie and i think it's very purposeful um and so so anyway watch the olympics and uh so chapters eight and nine this week i look forward to some again rich discussion try and get in there early uh, it's a little tough on the end of the week when I have to read so many. So if people can kind of spread that out a little bit. So I'm reading more every day. And um, so if you can get in there early, that's even better. And so I will see you in those discussions and, and have a great week. And go watch the Olympics. It's really, really fun.